the psalm just kind of talks about, you know, just stay near me, God, even though even though I'm trying to run away from you, or I try sometimes, please stay near me.
that stuff, so I don't knock it over. <laughs> thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Connor, and thank you to Mary uh, for leading us in our time of singing. Thank you to the choir. Uh, Kevin back there in the sound booth, he had a lot to do today, um, including trying to give me a trailer driving lesson. So I have to be shaved about eight or nine years off of his life for that. <laughs> uh, we definitely need to express our thanks there. Um, thank you to our ushers, our attendance counters, our office personnel, and you guys who help us in so many ways each and every week. If you are between the ages of four and you have uh, not yet started the fourth grade, then you are invited to go with Miss Kathy to Children's Church. Wasn't that lovely special music? I thought it was really good. What he didn't tell you is uh, he composed and arranged that. Um, so that's his song, literally. Um, so I thought you did a great job on that. So do I get a co-songwriting credit for that? Yeah, there you go. Um, I'm looking at the clock because I, I do that. And I see that it is, uh, for those of you taking medicine, 20 minutes till 12. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you we will not be done at noon today. Um, I, I will motor through this just as quickly as I can, but uh, yeah, um, noon is just out of the question. So uh, just hold on and we're going to try to pick them up and put them down as best we can together uh, this morning. Come to this sacred table, not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify not that you are righteous, but that you sincerely love our Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciple. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because you have any claim on heaven's rewards, but because in your frailty and sin you stand in constant need of heaven's mercy and help. Come not to express an opinion, but to seek his presence and pray for his spirit. The Lord's Supper is an ordinance given to the church by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And this ministry and gift to the church has existed from the earliest days after Christ's death through our worship service even here today. And yet even with its vast history and biblical foundations, many still struggle to answer the question, what purpose does the Lord's Supper serve? And so as we prepare today to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, I want to invite you to discover the answer to that question with me from the scriptures this morning. Our focal verse today is Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 30, and really this is the origin of the Lord's Supper. And then we will take a little trip through the scripture as we uh, discover the purpose that the Lord's Supper serves uh, within our churches today. And so if you will, I invite you to stand with me to look at Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to start reading in verse 26, and we'll read through verse 30 together this morning. Matthew chapter 26. Verse 30, 26 through 30. And the word of the Lord says this. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat it. This is my body. Then he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood that establishes the covenant. It is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I tell you, from this moment I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it in a new way in my Father's kingdom with you. And after singing psalms, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's pray. Our Father, as we look at your word today, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and that we would hear. That, Father, we would discover the value and purpose of the Lord's Supper among us from your word today. And that, Lord, we would take it in a joy and a newness of life that comes only from you. Lord, we rejoice in this time together, and I pray that you would speak to us so clearly. And it's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. As we look at this passage, the Apostle Matthew 
is really recounting the intimacy and the beauty of the first Lord's Supper. Around the table on the night before his death, the Lord Jesus shared the bread and the cup with his disciples, really as an illustration of what was about to take place. He took the bread and he would break it. That's how they would share it. They would take a loaf and they would break it up. And he handed it out to each one of them as a representation of the breaking his body would experience. And then he took the cup and he said, you know, the cup here represents my blood. Well, in order to, to fill the cup, you would pour into the cup from a, a larger vase of some kind. And so really he's giving that illustration of my blood that's been poured out, establishing a new covenant, forgiving the sins of many. And at the very heart of the Lord's Supper, this broken body and shed blood offers us a foundation for the purpose of this solemn event. Uh, the totality of the scriptures offers us one overarching purpose that the Lord's Supper serves us today. But that purpose is carried out in four distinct expressions within the scripture. And so this morning, as we look to the Word of God, it tells us uh, that the primary purpose is that of memorial. When you look at 1 Corinthians 11.26, the scripture says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. It is the Lord's Supper that ultimately serves as our memorial around the death of Christ. Now I know we're, we're, we're Christians, and, and we're especially Christians in, in what we would call Western Christendom, and usually what we try to hold up as the memorial of Christ's death is Easter. We look at Easter, and we look at Good Friday, and we look at Easter Sunday, and we hold that up there, and we go, this is the memorial of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And while that's all fine and good, here's the thing. Easter is not the biblical memorial of Christ's death. We're given a more regular reminder in the Lord's Supper. I'll go one step further that Easter's not the memorial of Christ's resurrection either. That's Sunday. That's why we have church on Sundays, to memorialize the fact that Christ rose today. And so the Scripture tells us that the Lord's Supper is a proclamation of the death of Christ each time we take it. Whether we take it today, or we take it next Sunday, or we take it every Sunday, the Lord's Supper's purpose is to proclaim Christ's death. And it proclaims that through four distinct expressions in the Scripture. The first expression of this purpose is that the Lord's Supper serves as a memorial of Christ's suffering for sins. It is a memorial of Christ's suffering for sins. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 50 verse 6, I gave my back to those who beat me and my cheeks to those who tore out my beard. Look, I've cut myself shaving. I can't even fathom what having your beard torn out must feel like. But he gave himself this. I did not hide my face from scorn and spitting. That would be bad enough, but Isaiah goes on in chapter 53, verses 4 through 6 to say, Yet he himself bore our sicknesses and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him as stricken and struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded because of our transgressions. Crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. What the prophet Isaiah describes 800 years before it happens is the suffering that the Lord Jesus would undertake in his body for sin, the physical affliction he would experience because of sin. When we break the bread, we remember the physical suffering of the Lord Jesus for the sins that we often commit without any concern of the consequence. You know, oftentimes we, we will sin and just think, oh, well, it's all under the blood. Oftentimes I've heard the phrase, but once saved, always saved. Folks, look, every sin 
that you've committed past, present, and future are paid for through the suffering of Jesus Christ. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are reminded of the physical toll our sin takes. And it should cause us to pause in a moment of gratitude that by and large, you don't pay it. Now look, I'm the first one that will tell you, sin always comes with a consequence. Even in this life, sin carries a consequence. But the physical toll of sin is one consequence we don't pay because of what the Lord Jesus has done. As we partake of the Lord's Supper, we must remember that one of the primary expressions the Scripture gives us for the purpose of the Lord's Supper is to remember the physical suffering of Christ for our sins. And as we remember, it should produce a feeling of gratitude for what He's done. The second expression of this purpose is that the Lord's Supper serves as a memorial of Christ's atoning work in the New Covenant. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, God presented Him as a propitiation, really what that means is acceptable sacrifice, through faith in His blood to demonstrate His righteousness because in His restraint God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented Him to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time so that He would be righteous and declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. What Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 28 is this. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. It is in the Lord's Supper that we are reminded that Christ died to produce a new covenant that brings forth life. We talked about this last week when we talked about the humanity of Christ, that it satisfied and fulfilled the demands of the law. In Christ's death, we have a new covenant that is established that unlike the law which could only bring death, brings life. In the Lord Jesus, the penalty and punishment for sin has been satisfied. The holy and righteous wrath of God is satisfied through what Jesus has done. So often, I think we live like we're trying to pay off a debt that we can't pay. I think we carry a lot of guilt and a lot of frustration and, and almost this worker's mentality, if I'll just work harder, things will be better. The Lord's Supper is here to help you understand something. You can't work hard enough. You can't. You cannot earn the grace and favor of God. That's not a part of the new covenant. Your work is worthless. Let me share this with you because I want to make sure we all get it. Sin at every level pays a wage. Whether it's an itty bitty sin or great old big sin, it pays a wage and it is the same wage every time. It is death. And it does not matter how hard you work, how difficultly you strive, how zealous you are for the things of God, sin pays a wage of death. And it is only through the new covenant where the Lord Jesus died to satisfy the payment of that wage that you can be in right relationship with God. This is the beauty of the Lord's Supper. It reminds you, you can't be good enough to earn your salvation. But rather that Christ through God's love and mercy has already done that. Through his death, God's wrath is satisfied. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that a beautiful image? That God in total, perfect, absolute, holy wrath can be satisfied through the death of Christ and a new covenant between God and God.
and God can be established that brings life. Folks, when we take the bread and we take the cup, we memor memorialize the death of Jesus Christ that brings life. In the Lord's Supper, we recognize the inability of all of us to earn our salvation. And in the Lord's Supper, we memorialize the death of Christ in establishing a new covenant for us. The Lord's Supper is expressed in its purpose through a memorial that Christ suffered for sin. But it also expresses in memorial that Christ's death establishes a new covenant of life. But the third expression of this purpose is that the Lord's Supper also serves as a memorial of our unity in the Lord Jesus. It is a memorial of our unity in the Lord Jesus. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, the cup of blessing that we give thanks for, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? In a church that was splintering in division there in Corinth, the Apostle Paul reminds them that this glorious memorial of the Lord Jesus Christ is a reminder of the unity that Christ has paid for. Prior to the work of Christ, we were enslaved to sin. We were enslaved to our own selfish desires in sin. But because of what Christ has done, He has brought forth freedom where we can walk in unity with one another. He has literally taken us as an individual and He has placed us within Himself collectively. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, what we're saying is we are all bound together by Christ and in Christ. Isn't that beautiful? When you're sitting there and you feel absolutely alone, anybody ever felt alone? I'm sure most of us have. It is the work of Christ that is memorialized in the Lord's Supper that tells you, you are not alone. You are not isolated on an island by yourself. You are not separated from God's family. Christ bought you collectively. He bought you and placed you within Himself and within His local body of believers. And He made you one together. Guys, we do not live apart from one another. This is one of the hardest concepts and constructs that I, I ever had to grasp as a believer. Whether it's in our home, or in our jobs, or in our church, in our work, whatever we do, wherever we are, we are not living on our own. We are tied together. God called you to be a part of a local body of believers. Now whether that's here or you're visiting from another church or you go to a church somewhere in another state, you are bought and tied to a local body of believers that God has called you to be a part of. And in every area and aspect of your life, that tying plays out. When you hurt, we hurt collectively. When something helps you, it helps the body as a whole. When we work together for a purpose, God is glorified in that. We are united because of what Christ has done. And if the Lord's Supper does not illustrate anything else to us, it expresses that unity. Why? Because you take bread that is baked together in the same loaf and you tear that apart and you give it to everyone. You're not tearing it apart to divide it. It's broken apart and given to each one so that we realize we are part of something bigger than ourselves collectively. We are brought together 
And it is memorialized in the Lord's Supper. All the juice we're going to drink today got poured from the same bottle. How do you know that, preacher? Because I poured it. I went and got the bottle off the shelf. I thought for a particularly moving experience, we could use prune juice instead of grape juice. <laughs> but then I decided against that. <laughs> Folks, we are united with one another. It is because of the Lord's Supper we are reminded of that. Because heaven knows we need to be reminded. Because it is so easy to begin looking at our brothers and sisters with suspicion and with anger and with frustration and with mistrust. And folks, those things have no place in the body of Christ. We are not to be guilty of gossip and backbiting and slander and deceit. Because if it hurts our brother, it hurts us. You cannot... Be healthy in your relationship with Christ and be at war with your members in the church. It can't happen. And so we must make that concerted effort at memorializing that. And then, here's the big shopper, putting that into practice in our daily living. To love and to care for and to cherish even those people that drive us nuts and have hurt us. To love and cherish and care for and build up and strengthen and support and encourage. Because what helps them helps us. What hurts them hurts us. It is a memorial of the unity that has been purchased by Christ. But there is a fourth expression, and I believe every other expression of the Lord's Supper is really validated in this final expression. The fourth expression of this purpose is that the Lord's Supper is a memorial of the need for self-examination. It is a memorial of our need for self-examination. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, 28, So a man should examine himself, and in this way he should eat the bread and drink from the cup. In the face of all that we memorialize in this event, we are reminded here that we must constantly examine ourselves before the Lord. Before the Lord's Supper, we come face to face with the reality of our struggle with sin each and every day. When we look within our life, we see the cracks within the foundation of our faith. When we look within our life, we see the failings that oftentimes haunt our nights. When we look at the Lord's Supper, we see the fadings that have happened within our marriage. Maybe the eroding that is taking place within our parenting. Maybe we're seeing the, the breaking down of our relationships. <laughs> When we really look at the Lord's Supper, we are to examine ourselves and see who we really are. To see the bitterness and the unforgiveness and the unfaithfulness, the self-righteousness and the pride. And we see those things when we look at the Lord's Supper and examine ourselves before the Lord, and yet we are told not to turn away. When I was growing up, I believe we grossly misunderstood what self-examination meant. The idea that if there's anything in your heart that's not right, you shouldn't partake in the Lord's Supper. I don't think that's what Paul says here. Paul says we're to self-examine, and then we are to partake. I think we're supposed to examine who we really are in the face of what Christ has done. And I think we take of the Lord's Supper at that point realizing that the only hope we have to be molded and shaped to be more than we are today is the person and work of the Lord Jesus that this supper represents. I think that in the Lord's Supper we see our failing. And I think we also witness His sufficiency. How many of you have sinned in the last week? How many of you, as we worked on that fair yesterday, might have said thinking some things about some of those folks we were working with? No, I'm just kidding. I don't want you to 
Guys, sin is a real part of our lives. When we stop thinking sin is a real part of our lives, then we are in trouble. When we stop being willing to examine ourselves before the standard of God and recognize that, look, we don't have it all together. We're not perfect. We do struggle. We have hardships. We didn't do this right. We have these issues. When we stop recognizing that, the Lord's Supper loses its value to us. Because when we think we've got it all together, we don't. And we are simply becoming blind to the failings that exist within us. As we self-examine ourselves before the Lord's Supper, what we really see here is the total and complete lack of sufficiency within us and the holy, absolute sufficiency of Christ in Him. When we bring ourselves with all of our failings to the Lord's Supper, what we're really doing is we're saying a we're having a time of submission, saying, Jesus, I submit myself for you to make me more than I am. For you to take what I am and make it what you want it to be. Because only you can do it. It's a memorial that we must constantly Examine ourselves before our Savior and allow Him to move and work within us as He sees fit. To chisel us where we need to be chiseled, to shape us where we need to be shaped, to rub us where we need to be rubbed, to sandblast us where we need to be sandblasted. <laughs> it's a moment of memorial for our submission to His sufficiency over our own. And this morning, I'm inviting you to partake of the Lord's Supper with me. Today, you are invited to remember Christ's suffering for sin, to remember His death, establishing a new covenant, to recognize the unity that He has provided for us. But it starts with an invitation to evaluate yourself before the Lord. This isn't the time for you to lean over to your spouse and go, he's talking to you. <laughs> it's a time for you to look before your Lord and say, he's talking to me. A time for you to allow the Lord Jesus to really have open access into your life and to evaluate yourself against the standards he has provided. For some of you, the reality of your sin and the absence of a true relationship with the Lord Jesus is what's weighing on your mind today. You're here and you have never trusted in the person and work of the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and the saving of your soul. And today the Lord Jesus is speaking to your heart. And you know that He's calling you to surrender yourself to Him as Lord and Savior. For some of you, you've just been doing your own thing. There was a time when you trusted Christ as your Savior. But you know as well as I do that today, if the Lord Jesus were to come, the only experience you have before your Lord is shame because of the negligence that you have lived your Christian life with. And today the Lord Jesus is calling you to walk away from your selfishness and walk away from the desire of sin that you've been holding on to and to rededicate yourself to Him as your Lord and your Savior. For some of you, He's calling you to make your relationship right with His church. For some of you, He's calling you to become a member here at United Baptist Church. Maybe you've been putting that off for any number of reasons, but the Lord is speaking to your heart about this. And, and this is the deal. I know we have our own plans and our own thoughts and our own ideas and our own goals. But what it boils down to is if He's truly Lord, when He speaks, we obey. And if He's saying, you need to make this right, then make it right. And present yourself for membership today at United Baptist Church. For some of you, it may be a matter of baptism. Maybe you've never made your public profession of faith. And today, the Lord Jesus is telling you, you need to do this. I'm telling you to do this. And the Lord's calling you as you have trusted in Him to make that a reality. And this morning, you need to present yourself for believer's baptism. But whatever the Lord is calling you to do, I would invite you to do that. And for everyone here today, the Lord is calling you to evaluate yourself.
before we partake of the Lord's Supper. To sit there and just allow the Lord to look into your life. To expose the areas where you're struggling, where you're failing. Not to make you feel bad and guilty. But rather to allow Him to show you where it is He wants to work in you and through you for His glory.